Father, we thank you for just the anointing of the presence of the Lord, the, uh, the, 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 the blessed outpouring of your goodness on us. Uh, we welcome you even now in, in the word to just illuminate uh, our hearts with truth. Open up the eyes of our understanding. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to teach us, lead us into uh, breakthrough and wisdom and, and uh, that which you have ordained for the body. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. What's been on my heart this week a little bit is that, uh, that we would be the story. That we would be the story. So we get to hang out in uh, Reading this week at Revival Land. And, uh, and we were, you know, we were just there chasing the glory, you know, at Bethel Church, uh, as well as 600 other pastors. And uh, it was refreshing. It was good. It was good. And what's been on my heart, you know, and, I, you know, I trust it's on yours, too, is that we don't want to do church. We want to be the church. We don't want to read the stories. We want to be the story. I mean, yes, we want to read the stories. All the stories are there to encourage us, but they're also to empower us. We are an empowered people. So, you know, if you grew up in, if you grew up in church, grew up in Sunday school, you grew up around all of the stories that are in the Bible. You grew up around David and Goliath. You heard, you've heard David and Goliath a thousand different ways and a thousand different times, you know, maybe. Um, but maybe the application wasn't there, you know. So you heard it in the fourth grade or the fifth grade or, you know, I think we can become so familiar with these stories that they just become stories. We don't own them as identity. They just become stories. And that's, you know, that's a danger. It's a little bit of a danger. You know, third grade, you go home, you hear about David and Goliath, and so you go conquer, you know, your marbles. You know, what are you going to go do? What are you going to go conquer? You know, what enemy will it be? So sometimes because there isn't, you know, immediate application to some of these stories, there isn't, there isn't, immediate activation to some of these stories, they can become almost surreal, almost, you know, like part of our, part of our heritage or part of our history, part of what we look to, but they're not necessarily part of our identity. And, and my craving for us as a people, for me, is that we would be the story. That we would be the story. You've heard about revival. You've heard about this meeting and that meeting and, and the other meeting. But we want to hear about your meeting. We want to live with such a passion, such a fire, such a desire. That whatever's lacking in us, in, in the glory, that we would be pursuing, 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 that we would never lose our pursuit of the fullness of God, the glory of God, the anointing of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit, and what a revival does and can do. Growing, you know, growing up in Pentecostal, uh, charismatic, you know, this kind of church, there would always be seasoned ones who had stories. You know, they lived through a revival, they lived through an outpouring, they lived through this, they lived through that. At one point, we had a—I don't know—it it, we had a guy coming to the church. His name was Moses. He was 99 years old. He was from the Puyallup tribe. And he lived through the Shaker revival that came through the Puyallup tribe. Did you know a great outpouring of the Spirit came through the Puyallup tribe? And, and at one time, virtually every member of the Puyallup Indian tribe was baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
And, and it was a shaker revival. A shaker revival is like you shake. Like the Holy Ghost comes on people in like an electric way with so much power. So right now at Bethel, a student has been shaking for 84 hours nonstop. So this stuff kind of happens, you know? So, yeah, so this was, uh, this was the Shaker revival that came through. But, you know, if you've lived around Pentecost and you've lived around the outpouring a little bit, you hear these stories. And those were the good old days. To that person, those were the good old days. And I think we have to have such a determination that we will make today a new day of glory. We will make today a new day of glory that we'll, that, that we'll keep pressing in. And, you know, I'm hearing of it all the time here. So this is not like, it's not like it's not happening. It's just that we're not going to let go of it. So Craig shared with me one of the small groups. He went to it on Friday night. They had five hours of worship and prophetic ministry, and, and it was awesome. Tuesday night, the, the GLOW meeting, you know, Frank and Angela, the married couple here, you know, their meetings came together Tuesday night. They had an outpouring of the Spirit and worship and the presence of the Lord. And so it's happening. It's happening. It's really the number one pursuit of all of our meetings. It's the number one pursuit of everything we're doing is not only partaking of the glory, but, but sharing the glory, loosing the glory, igniting one another in the glory. I mean, this is, this is, this is supreme. This is superior. This is, this is the most important thing. Because it's the anointing realm, the realm of the anointing, that makes the word come alive, that makes our walk come alive. And it's really the hope of our nation. It's the hope of our communities. His presence, his glory is the hope of, of you know, we've got election on Tuesday. We could get, you know, we could get some stuff. We could get some stuff. We're hearing about some conservative folks that are getting some traction. And, you know, we could see a little bit of increase of some good conservative values in government. That'd be cool. Anybody go for that? So, I, you know, I'm right there. I'm praying and I'm voting and, and that's good. But, um, wow, we can't, we can't pretend for a moment that that's the end of something good. What Father sees is a revived nation. And a revived people bring reformation. A revived nation brings reformation. I mean, this is, this, what he really wants is, is, he wants all of us so dripping wet with the anointing and with his presence. I think he wants it hard for us to, you know, your shadow should be bothered. You know, your shadow should be kind of bugged, you know. What do I mean by that? It's like, well, you know, you, you have a space around you. Right now I'm producing one, and it kind of depends on the light above me, but, but your shadow should be kind of bothered a little bit because the, the shadow of Peter brought healing to people. So there was proximity to the anointing. So when Peter walked through a room or walked down the street, the proximity around him was creating a disturbance in the atmosphere spiritually, and people were getting touched. I don't think these things are there for us to like read about and like, wow, that's a good story. These stories are to create hunger. These things that happen are to create hunger. And that's, you know, part of what Jesus said is that, that because he's leaving, those who believe in him, this is John 14, because of, of his leaving, those who believe in him 
not only will do the works he's doing, but they'll do greater works. Well, not, not if you're tied up in real estate. He didn't mean that. Or if you're in finance or if you're like a plumber, he didn't mean that. Electricians? No, no, no. He didn't mean anybody in like web services or, or telecommunications. That What he meant was he was just talking only for preachers right there. He's just talking about those who believe in him. Those who believe in him not only will do the works that he did, but they'll do greater works. I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm going to admit that before you. I'm not there yet. What's that mean? I'm hungry. Wow. I am I'm passionate. I'm hungry. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in pursuit. I'm desirous. I'm, I'm running after him. I'm creating an atmosphere where I can be energized by the Spirit. I'll take a little quaking and shaking. That'd be okay too. This is, this is our heritage. This is our desire. This is, this is who we are. Hebrews 6.12, we do not want you to be lazy. We do not, this is the NIV. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those. In other words, take on a lifestyle of those who through faith and patience, and the word patience, you know, it's not like I'll wait and see. Patience here, it means like perseverance. It's an act of hanging on to something. So I have these words over me, I have this indwelling Holy Spirit, I have this anointing over me, but I'm not going to become lazy about what I've received, I'm going to imitate those who've received the promise. So there's, there's people that have, they've gone on before me, they have a story, they had a story, I've heard some of their stories. No, I'm not going to be lazy or slothful, King James says slothful, I'm not, don't become slothful, another one says sluggish. It's easy, it's so easy to become distracted and it's so easy to become kind of emptied, just kind of like we leak, we leak. So every, every day, it's like we have a fresh pursuit of the Lord every day. Whatever measure I came up into yesterday, I'd love to build on that. But today is a brand new day of me pursuing the presence of the Lord, leaning into his anointing, leaning into his presence, leaning into his word, activating, activating what he's called me to, partnering with him, yielding to him in worship. Today's a brand new day. Today's a brand new day. Today's a brand new day. So it's every day that we're running after him, we're pursuing him, we're desiring him, we're yearning for him, and imitating those who've led the way, those who've walked in the power and the fire of the gospel. I think one of the ways that we, that we activate revival, and we've been doing that, one of the ways that we activate revival, one of the most important ways is with intercession. Intercession is like opening the faucet of what we desire and crave and what he wants to make available through us. Intercession is, is one, of, one of these tools in our arsenal of victory and ministry that he's called us to. And I think it... I think, Maybe because we don't like really delve in or I, I don't know, for me, it's one of those things that I can get slothful about, sluggish about, and lazy about. So then I'm not delving into it. If I'm not delving into it, then I'm not seeing victories around me. I'm not seeing victories to rejoice over. And if I'm not seeing victories to rejoice over and victories around me, then I can, I'm more prone to be kind of disillusioned with his desire to move in new and fresh ways. 
Because I'm not seeing him move, but I'm not seeing him move because I'm not engaging in this intercessory strategy, tactic, tool, and arsenal to actually open up the flow of Holy Spirit to move in new and fresh and powerful ways. So when we think about more of God, when we think about making making more of him available, encountering him in new and fresh ways, one of the things that's vital for us to reference and understand and engage in is that we just become a vessel of intercession. This is the, this what intercession was and is the highest priority of the life of Jesus. I'm thinking, Lord, uh, show me some examples of intercession. And I'm, I'm like trying to rack my brain with examples of intercession in the scripture. And then all at once he like just drops down into me like Jesus was the example of intercession. And it, and it, opened up glory through him. He became a glory portal. He became a glory portal. And he's called the chief intercessor. The Hebrews says that the, he ever lives to make intercession for us. I mean, this is, this is, he's known as this, right? And could it be that his lifestyle of intercession opened up this, this crazy portal of, of the glory of God to be manifest through him in ways that we just kind of haven't tasted of yet fully? Am I making any sense at all? Uh, I, I, got an, I got another example over here um, of how intercession... Partners with revival, partners with glory, partners with the anointing. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It was, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the feast or the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handed him over to, the, to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. So 16 soldiers are guarding Peter. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but... But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The church began to intercede. Intercession is, is weird. Intercession is not praying for you. Intercession is praying for somebody else. Intercession is bringing somebody by name before the Lord. Bringing somebody else before the Lord, and, and not only before the Lord, but bringing somebody else before the enemy to judge the enemy, to overthrow the enemy. So actually, actually the announcement of the Lord's intercession was made by Isaiah in chapter 61. And then there's another announcement of it because he makes the announcement when he agrees with it in Luke chapter 4. In Isaiah 61, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Remember that passage? How many of you remember that passage, Isaiah 61? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those that are captives. And, you know, and he just he goes through this whole thing. And he actually says, and actually to bring vengeance on the enemies. 
It's like he calls it the day of vengeance and the day of jubilee altogether. And the vengeance was on Satan. Intercession enters into a realm where you bind up the darkness, you bind up the unclean realm that's harming someone else. That's what you do in intercession. You actually come into the high priestly intercessory role of Jesus and you start praying for that friend or that person that doesn't know the Lord. This is what they started doing for Peter. They started for praying for Peter. The whole church, the ecclesia or ecclesia, they begin to pray for Peter. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Get up quick, or quick get up. <laughs> he said and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When he had walked the length of, the, of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. What provoked that rescue? Intercession. Intercession. They weren't praying for themselves back at the meeting. They'd been praying for days, by the way. They had been praying for days. Why do we know that? Well, because they had been praying for multiple days. And when this happened, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered. And they were praying. They were still praying. He knocks on the door. He surprises them. They're in the house praying. He's coming to the door. But their intercession provoked angelic visitation, not only seen angelic visitation, but invisible angelic visitation. I am totally convinced that this is one, this is one of the most, empower, most important tools of working with revival, working with the glory, busting open a portal of glory and goodness. You've got stories about it in your own life. You've got stories about stuff like this in your own life that happened because you started praying for somebody else. You started praying for somebody else and your prayer was a breakthrough prayer for them. We went to dinner Tuesday night with uh, a bunch of other couples from our Washington State and Canada revival group. So there's a bunch of us that went together uh, to dinner, pastors and, and leaders. One pastoral team brought a, an eldership couple with them. The husband is head of maintenance for Hawaiian Airlines North America, and the wife is a dental hygienist. So we all went around the table, and we were going to tell them a little bit about our stories and who we were. And so we came to the wife, this is Jennifer, and she, uh, she, started, she wanted to tell what God had been doing. And he'd been doing something for seven years. It had been going on for seven years, and it was so encouraging, I wanted you to hear it. Because this is what Holy Spirit's going to be doing with you, with us. Because our passion is not just to hear stories, but to be the story. You're going to start taking risk to be the story. God's going to meet your risk as you launch out, step out to be the story. 
So she'd been working in this uh, dental office, and um, it was a large dental office. Uh, had several thousand pediatric patients, and it was mainly focused on uh, immigrants and low-income families. And the insurance that they paid for the dental care with was um, like a special kind of insurance. And so doctors had to take a lower rate. And so she had been working in one office and, and uh, that doctor closed down his agreement with the insurance. So they moved to a new office and she just felt like to begin to pray, intercede for the people in her office. So she's praying for office, and, and I think she was, you know, potentially praying like most of us pray. I, I, most of us pray for stuff very generically. Lord, save the people in my office. Lord, minister to the people in my office. Lord, I'm just, you know, praying for the people in my office. And a lot of times we're offering up these generic prayers, and, but they aren't pinpointed. It's almost like would Peter have been delivered if they would have been praying for everybody at the prison? We're just going to gather up. We're going to spend about five nights in prayer. We're going to pray for everybody at the prison. And so they're just praying, Lord, bless the guys at the prison. And, and it just minister to the people at the prison. And we just, we just ask you to save some of the folks at the prison. And would that have been an effective deliverance prayer for Peter? I don't think so, but I mean, that's kind of how we pray. And so she spent seven years praying for her office and not a thing had happened. And then one day they were actually, they were driving through town. This is in Clark County down here in Vancouver. They were driving through her and her husband and they felt drawn to a church. And they're like, oh, Holy Spirit, what's that? And they just, they just knew Holy Spirit was calling them to this church. And... Um, so they went and they started visiting this church and the pastor was like ministering on deliverance and he was engaged in encouraging deliverance and they had started a bunch of prayer meetings and they had a lot of, uh, not deliverance, intercession. And so they had all these intercessory prayer meetings going and they're teaching and preaching on intercession and, and so they dove into it and one night she goes to a prayer meeting and it's focused on intercession, and then she goes to a prayer meeting, and the pastor says to her, Jennifer, is there anything that we could pray with you about or believe with you about? And she says, yeah, I've been praying for my dental office for seven years uh, that somebody would get saved, and nobody's been saved. And he, he was like taken back. He was like freaked out. He's like, nobody's gotten saved? And she said, nobody's gotten saved. She said, he said, give me the name of one. So she thinks of like the hardest one. Dawn. Dawn was there, and Dawn was like, you know, totally like, I don't know how to describe her, but um, very atheistic. And so she says, all right, let's pray for Dawn. And so he stands up, and he begins to just pray kind of the way we pray. He just, he just begins to call Dawn out of darkness, and he commands that she's loosed, and he just takes authority over uh, the strongholds and the power of the enemy over her life, and he just calls her out of darkness into the light of the Lord, and he calls her saved, and he's just, you know, he's just kind of doing what we do here. It's just, you know, it's the kind of stuff that we're used to, is what he did over dawn, specifically over dawn. Forty days later, to the day, don't know what that's about, she doesn't either. Dawn came frantically to her desk. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. I know you know God. I don't know God. I need to know God. Tell me about God. I have to have God. She gets born again. So her and Jennifer and Dawn, they start praying for others, and they, you know, they focus on Dawn's assistant. Five days later, Dawn's assistant got born again. They just start praying for more. There was a Russian girl that had backslidden and wasn't walking with the Lord. Her name was Tanya. They started focusing on Tanya. Tanya gets born again. Tanya is like crazy. They start sharing their faith with everybody in the office. 
One day, one day they came in, the Holy Spirit was moving so powerfully that they felt like they walked into a vortex when they came into the office. It's like, like, a, like a John G. Lake experience. They came into the office, you could just feel the presence of the Lord. They were asking the dental assistants to turn off the nitrous because they were sure that somebody had left it on because like everybody felt giggly and light and it was just like the presence was just different and just like people were like free several got born again that day by the end of the first year 24 had given their lives to the lord 24 hygienists and dental assistants and doctors had given their lives to the lord at the end of the first year this is in clark county right here in vancouver That was like seven years ago. I mean, it was like seven years ago. It just, it's continued. It continued for seven years. Yeah, let's stand this morning. I'm just, I'm just telling you that there's something special about, there was something special in Acts 12 about naming Peter. There was something special about naming Dawn. There was something special about naming Tonya. There was something special about the power of intercession to open a glory portal for the, for the Lord to work and for the Holy Spirit to touch somebody, for them to be brought out of darkness and brought into light. And this, this, is, this is like one of our tools. This is a revival tool that we're, we pack this tool. We carry this tool. But as I listened to her story, I was convicted with Hebrews 6.12 that I had become lazy, slothful, and sluggish in using this tool. And then I was reminded of Isaiah 62 where it says, the watchman on the wall should give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her a praise in the earth. So I'm just bringing this word to you. I'm just, as the Holy Spirit was touching me, I'm just bringing this word to you. What more could Holy Spirit do? What more could he do through the power of intercession? What more could he do through lives of intercession? What more could he do through the opening portal of intercession. So Holy Spirit, we just, we present ourselves to you right now. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to stir us and quicken us and refresh us and renew us in what could be. Holy Spirit, we ask you to provoke within us the desire to have our own story the desire to have our own story. It's good to hear the story of Jennifer, the story of Peter. It's good to hear the story of the New Hebrides and the Great Awakenings. But Holy Spirit, provoke within us the yearning, the fire, the passion, the hunger for our own stories, the pursuit of you. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed just for a moment still. I want to ask the prayer team to come forward. Those of you serving today and the destiny team, if you'd come. I don't, I don't think we should leave. Uh, quite yet. I just, I just want to open the front for prayer as we go. If you're here today, just even this message has touched you. You feel... You acknowledge just a dryness within you, a a coldness spiritually. I want to invite you to the front to be prayed for, to be ministered to, to be encouraged in the Spirit. If you're here this morning and there's some kind of a blockage between you and the Lord, oh, I'm encouraging you, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. Come to the front, be prayed for, be ministered to.
When I talk about spiritual hunger, when I talk about spiritual hunger, if, you, if you're able to hear me talk about spiritual hunger and it literally just passes by you and, 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 and you just move on to the next thing and, and it doesn't awaken something within you, I'm inviting you to just come and just bring that to the Lord. Ask him to ask him to meet you. Ask him to awaken something fresh within you, a fresh pursuit of him. Let's close in worship.